Okay, I'm going to get started. Um, uh, I'll mention at the outset here, I, I hope we have time for Q&A at the end. Um, you should be aware I'm trying to stream this talk, so if you ask a question, your voice may be broadcast. Um, if you ask it quietly, then I will you know, restate it for the, uh, the audience uh, if there is one. Uh, all right. Um, my name is Cody Hansen. I'm the uh, Director of Web Development at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, really pleased to be here. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to talk and uh, grateful to the organizers of another fantastic library technology conference um, and to Tim McAllister for, for hosting us. Um, I feel like I, I need to start off this talk with a few disclaimers. Um, I've been fortunate enough to speak here at Library Technology Conference a couple of times before, um, and it's possible that some of you have seen those talks and thought, hey, that was interesting to me. I'll go see his next talk. This will not be like my earlier talks. <laughs> um, I've come here in the past talking about projects that we've worked on um, at uh, the University of Minnesota Libraries, um, you know, websites we've built and things like that. I'm giving one of those talks later today, actually. Um, but uh, this talk is firmly in sort of op-ed territory. Um, this is my personal opinion. Um, these are some things that have been kicking around in my head for a while, and uh, I uh, am going to shamelessly use this as an opportunity to get them out. Um, as, uh, as a consequence of that, I hope it goes without saying that these opinions do not represent my employer, the state of Minnesota, um, uh, any, anything, anything like that. Um, the other uh, related disclaimer I want to give is I work at, at, at an academic library, and these are these opinions that I've, I've uh, put together here are based on my experience working in academic libraries. I've never worked in another kind of library. If you work in a public or special or uh, K-12 library, um, I am not going to try to conjecture about how what I'm describing here today applies directly to your library. I hope you will forgive me for that. Um, I would rather uh, let you use your imagination and hopefully listen with goodwill uh, than I would uh, try to make some things up about how things go in your library because I don't know. Uh, the last thing that I want to say here is that uh, I have been living with uh, some of the stuff in this talk for so long that I'm not sure if it is totally obvious or if it's boring um, or if it's annoying or maybe even probably won't be straight up offensive. But um, anyway, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll have time for some Q&A and some discussion um, and uh, if you get a little bit into it and you decide, you know what, this is boring. Um, there are lots of other great talks um, going on right now. I encourage you to check them out. I will not be offended. All right, with that, this is basically the thesis of my talk. I think that we need to change our relationship with software. And when I say we, I mean librarianship as a profession. I mean individual libraries and in some cases individuals. Um, I think that the role of software in libraries has changed in meaningful ways. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how I think uh, the role of software in libraries has changed. Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples of the implications of those, change, those changes. And uh, just so this whole thing isn't a huge bummer, um, I'm going to try to uh, give a few ideas about how we might respond. Uh, to these to these changes and how we can change our relationship with software. Um, some of you might know that uh, I first started formulating these thoughts in the form of a, a an essay that I wrote and published on my website last fall. Um, this is not this is really small. This is not intended for you to read um, on, off the screen. It's just a screenshot for better illustration. Um, I will uh, provide the link to this if you're curious, um, but. Uh, uh, this is not a prerequisite for, for this talk. I just want to make that clear. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, this, this essay and this talk, um, this, this essay begins with the same phrase that I've used to, to title this talk, libraries or software. 
and I want to acknowledge that that's a sort of an awkward construction. Um, and hopefully it will become clear uh, why I chose that by the end of this talk, but I also wanted to, um, now that I have a little bit of time to explain, tell you what I really wanted to call this essay um, and what I really wanted to call this talk, and that was Software Has Eaten the Library. <laughs> um, and some of you might know why I did not choose this phrase, um, and it's not just because of its sort of menacing tone. Um, so, Software Has Eaten the Library is a, a riff off of um, a talk, or a, a, an article written by uh, this guy, uh, Mark Andreessen, noted cone-headed libertarian venture capitalist <laughs> um, and uh, colonial apologist. Um, Mark Andreessen is not someone who I uh, share a lot of um, thoughts in common with, but uh, like a you know, VC-funded stopped clock, he's been right a couple of times. Um, the, the first time uh, that Mark Andreessen was sort of incredibly right was uh, when he was uh, a student working at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, uh, which is at the University of Illinois. Um, and while he was there, he developed a piece of software called Mosaic. Um, and here I, I have to uh, insert a little bit of an anecdote because uh, one summer when I was in, in high school, uh, I was taking classes here at McAllister through an organization that was then called T-City, and now I think it's called Mighty, I don't know if it still exists, but uh, I was taking a, a physics course, and we met in, in the basement of this building, um, that class. And one day, uh, my instructor said, you guys, I got something special for you today. Um, we're not gonna do our usual physics work today. I scheduled something, come on upstairs with me. And he brought us upstairs into this building, and into a computer lab. Um, computer labs were not that common at the time. Um, and it was a room full of Next boxes, Next computers. Um, and he had us sit down and open up Mosaic. Mosaic was really the first uh, widely distributed uh, graphical web browser. Um, and uh, it was pretty amazing uh, for a kid who'd grown up with VBSs and things like that uh, to see that. So. Uh, <laughs> That, that's my Mark Andreessen connection to this very building in which we sit. Uh, you sit, I stand. Um, based on his work creating Mosaic, Mark Andreessen went on to found Netscape. Um, so he's, he's been around in the internet space a long time. And so he wrote this essay, this opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal in 2011 called Why Software is Eating the World. And uh, this is the second time he was right. Uh, and what this uh, op-ed described was how uh, existing industries were being transformed and, yes, of course, disrupted uh, by software. Um, and that the current generation of software uh, platforms and tools was significantly different from software that had been deployed in business to date. Uh, it was not just about automating tasks. Um, it was about enabling new business models, about uh, destroying old business models. Um, th this whole thing was very techno-utopian and very 2011, but a lot of it uh, was right on the money. Um, so some of the examples that he used were Pixar. Um, Pixar was a company that was originally founded as by people who wanted to make movies uh, as a software and hardware company. They built uh, machines, <coughs> Pixar computers, um, and software that ran on them for 3D rendering. Um, and uh, the software that they made, they sold to Disney, licensed to Disney as part of their workflow. Um, and a guy named John Lasseter started making animated, computer animated films to show off the capabilities of Pixar's software, um, you know, just purely as an advertisement. Um, they, of course, were eventually acquired by Disney after making Toy Story and Toy Story 2. Um, and uh, by that time, the innovations that they had made um, through software were so valuable to Disney, the sort of old world animation house, that uh, Steve Jobs, who was then the CEO of Pixar and the, um, I think the, maybe the sole stakeholder at that point, became the single largest shareholder in Disney. Uh, six times, uh, having six times the, the shares of the uh, surviving Disney uh, family member. Um, 
Amazon, of course, is another example of how software has disrupted uh, traditional industries. You know, it's hard to even decide how to describe what Amazon is. I, the, the closest I could come up with is that there's some sort of like software powered arbitrage and logistics firm, but they have transformed retail, um, they've transformed IT with their infrastructure services and uh, software services, um, and at a scale that would have been impossible were it not for the kind of software that has uh, developed over the past you know, 15 or 20 years. Um, the last of, of the examples that he cites in that op-ed that I'm going to talk about is Spotify. Um, Spotify was a case where there was existing software in this space, um, but Spotify built on it in a way that made it something entirely other. Digitized music existed, MP3s, the iTunes store, things like that. Peer-to-peer -peer file transfer existed, uh, Kazaa, Napster, um, uh, Soul Seek for a little while. Anybody remember that? Um, and uh, what Spotify realized was that the combination of these two technologies would bring the costs of their business down far enough that they could enable uh, what some people would call the everything jukebox. Uh, that uh, by using peer-to-peer -peer file transfer to bring, bring their bandwidth costs down. By the way, did you know that Spotify is built on peer-to-peer? -peer? Ask your network administrator what it looks like when somebody's using Spotify. Um, <laughs> Uh, that they could they could uh, turn the the music distribution model on its head through software. Um, so those are a few examples that Andreessen cites, um, and I think there are some interesting parallels that we can talk about when we talk about how software has eaten the library. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with two examples here of how software has eaten the library. Um, the first is collections. Uh, Everyone who works in any kind of library knows that uh, we are pouring a greater and greater fraction of our budget into electronic resources. And with good reason, our users overwhelmingly prefer it, especially in academic libraries, if it is not online um, and you're not you know, a particular stripe of crusty humanitarian, <laughs> humanist rather, um, if it's not online, it might as well not exist. Um, and so, there's there's clear reason for us to be moving in this direction. And it's been very tempting for libraries to think about electronic resources as a one-to-one -one substitution for print. Um, that licensing a journal or licensing an ebook is a, an equivalent, and in fact maybe a little bit better, than purchasing or uh, the same journal or print book. But I think it is important to acknowledge here that these are complex web applications that deliver these resources. Collecting a bunch of uh, journal articles together into a web application like this is fundamentally different from, you know, I don't know, binding some journals in our library. Uh, each of these web applications that package up our electronic resources contain algorithms, their own taxonomies, they pipe in additional services, they have their own user interface, and any one of these can have a dramatic impact on information discovery, on information access. We're buying software when we license electronic resources. We're licensing software, whatever you want to call it. This is software. This is fundamentally different from uh, just buying a print or electronic resource. And I want to acknowledge that uh, we have a lot to be proud of here, maybe. We were pioneers in licensing electronic resources, in uh, privileging access over ownership. Uh, before anybody had a Spotify membership, when people were still hoarding CDs and MP3s, the libraries had come to terms with the idea that if we can access this electronically, that is good enough. You know, we don't need to own it, you know, perpetual access agreements aside. Um, and our ability to provide that um, access rather than ownership is enabled by software. So that's just a, a, a little bit about how software has affected our collections. The second thing that I want to talk about, um, second example of how software has eaten a library is in the area of discovery. Um, we've had software catalogs for decades. 
Um, the, the traditional OPAC was software, uh, but it was a relatively dumb translation in a lot of cases of analog to digital. It was a digitized card catalog, effectively. Uh, we often hosted the, the catalogs ourselves um, on servers that we owned and or controlled. And discovery is different. You know, whatever you want to call this, web scale discovery, the new breed of discovery interfaces that are uh, so important in libraries these days. Discovery is born digital. This is, there is no analog equivalent of uh, what is happening inside of uh, a discovery system. Discovery is driven by algorithms, uh, pulling in metadata and services from external sources that we rarely see and often can't influence. I'm gonna take a, a, a sidebar here and say, this is where I should have set up, a, up at the front. Another acceptable option for you during this hour is to just go back and watch this morning's keynote again. <laughs> um, because I'm going to, the word algorithm is gonna come up a whole lot here and um, Dr. Noble uh, said things uh, better than I will. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll say that it's a, uh, you know, resonant, right, and not, uh, not duplicative, hopefully. Another difference is that uh, between, you know, traditional library catalog software and discovery is that discovery is most often software as a service. It is hosted in the cloud by a vendor, maybe in a multi-tenant sort of environment, but it is hosted on servers that we don't control and don't have access to in the vast majority of cases. And I think that these are meaningful differences. They are inflection points in our library's relationship with software. If we're honest with ourselves about what an average visit to a university library today looks like, it takes place entirely within software. This workflow here, some kind of search, might be discovery, might be Google Scholar, might be something else, through our resolver, to a vendor site, and then hopefully to a source. This is hands down the most common interaction with our library. More common than walking through the door. Our software is the library for the vast majority of our users. This is certainly the case at the University of Minnesota. As early as the fall of 2014, visits to our main website alone Eclipsed gate counts at all of our branches combined. But the traffic to our website, um, this is just as an example, we have website, catalog, repository, yada, yada, yada. Um, traffic to that site is as much as 74% uh, off campus, network speaking. Um, so this is, these are users who are not connecting through the campus network. Um, it's possible they're on a phone on campus or you know, they have their own network connection somehow, but generally speaking, they're off campus. So these uses of our library, these visits to our library, take place entirely within software and are entirely unmediated, we have to assume, when we, when we take, you know, just statistically speaking, and that's even the case for visits that come from within the library. Uh, I believe that our library spaces are increasingly just spaces to interact with our software. There are places for students to come in and interact with our catalogs and our electronic resources and things like that, and lots of other software too. Um, I think there are few, if any, services that we offer that are not enabled by Software, instruction, <coughs> event registration, reference, all of these require software, even if it's just a librarian accessing our systems on behalf of the user. That software is, is essential to what we do. Um, even archival work, finding aids, digitization, all dependent on software. Um, and there's a lot that's really good about this. Software has dramatically increased productivity for us who work in libraries and for our patrons um, who can rapidly scan far more resources than they ever could uh, uh, 
in, in an analog situation, um, to enable them to collect references, to get digital ILL delivery in hours and not days. Um, software is, has dramatically increased our productivity. And software, of course, is how we scale. This is how we serve more people with more information resources and fewer financial and HR resources. Uh, the only way we can do that is with software. Software is how we moved from an era of information scarcity to an era of information abundance. And software is how we can manage that abundance. It's the only way that we can manage that abundance. Um, and this software has brought us to the point where our software is our public services. I believe this very strongly. Um, and statistically speaking, I think there's no question that this is the case. Uh, this is how we're serving the most of our most of our users. This is, in my opinion, the only way that we can meet the emerging needs and expectations of our users. It's the only way we can scale our services. But there's a corollary here, and that's that our public services can only be as good as our software. And this is where I have some concerns um, that I think warrant a change in our relationship with software. I'm concerned that we're not taking the care with our software that these circumstances dictate. I think we are not treating it as our most valuable, visible service. I think we're often treating software as a commodity, or as a black box, as Dr. Noble described it this morning. And I think there are some ramifications uh, to that posture that we need to contend with. Um, and I'm going to give two examples here. Uh, first has to do with our values. Um, if our public service occurs in a black box, how do we ensure that it conforms to our values? Because if you ask me, a search, a workflow that takes somebody from a search through to a source looks a whole lot like reference and circulation to me. It happened across several pieces of software without any intervention from library staff. And of course, we know that the second step of that workflow takes place all within a vendor interface typically, right? Search, source, search, source, search. You know, you, you, get into a, a database or some sort of aggregation, run another search, find some more resources, scans, PDFs, all within a single web application that we don't control. And this is what concerns me. Software wants to remember. It takes careful engineering to not know what users are doing inside of a, a modern web application. It takes further engineering to forget what users did in your application. None of that happens by accident. And if you've been in the field of librarianship for very long, you will probably remember this sign. Um, remember how proud we were? So this is uh, in the early 2000s, uh, post-Patriot Act, when libraries were getting national security letters um, demanding information, circulation records, and things like that from patrons. And Librarians took some very brave stands, um, and this is one example of the sort of canary letter that uh, skirted the, the, uh, uh, the national security letter uh, requirements a little bit to enable libraries to, uh, uh, to communicate with their users. Today, we're inviting and arguably requiring that our users turn over in digital form information that most of us were taught not to write down. Personally identifiable information connected to search queries, connected to information access. Our incentives are not necessarily aligned with the organizations that provide these resources, that provide this software. Um, Dr. Noble mentioned this morning that uh, Google's algorithm is an advertising algorithm. That's not the case, thankfully, with, uh, with library resources. But if I'm an employee of a for-profit or even a non-profit vendor in the library space, 
it would be irresponsible of me to not be concerned about downloads, retention, our relationship with library patrons, branding. And it would be irresponsible for me to not measure as much as absolutely possible. Vendors got to vend. <laughs> and so I asked the question, does our software conform to our professional values in this regard? We can't know because it's software as a service, black box. We can ask for assurances and contracts, but we can't know. We should know. The second example of, that I want to give of the implications of software reading the library is one that's going to be very familiar from uh, the keynote this morning. That's about algorithmic bias. Uh, so Matthew Riedsma wrote this uh, fantastic essay, Algorithmic Bias in Library Discovery Systems. I'll have a link uh, later in the slides. Um, and looking at a, a feature in Summon called the Topic Explorer, which is something that suggests further terms for uh, and resources for investigation alongside your search results in, in the application. Um, and he highlighted some problems that he found uh, in the algorithm and the, the sources that power that service. So for example, you do a search for Return of the King, and you got back The King of Kong, which is a documentary about uh, competitive Donkey Kong players, which is funny. Um, but, but less funny is when you search for the American Journal of Transplantation and get the American Journal of Sociology, which is just not useful at all. Uh, and what is terrifying is when you search for mental illness and are suggested the myth of mental illness. Um, Matthew Riesma argues very convincingly that uh, we have a moral responsibility here, uh, that uh, we uh, have a moral responsibility who create technologies that libraries are beholden to. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I would take it a little further too, because I think we have a professional responsibility and I think we have a professional interest because as crappy as some of these topic explorer results may appear, this is the closest thing that I have seen to a software native reference type experience. This is our work. And the topic explorer is a particularly visible example of algorithmic bias because it's one result highlighted in a large space in the user interface. Well, what else on this page is algorithmically generated? Hell, what isn't? <laughs> the search results, the facets, the terminology that surfaced here, this is Donkey Kong all the way down. All algorithmically generated. Um, by the way, I should mention that the topic explorer isn't always wrong when you search for the Prince Machiavelli, um, you get the arguably <laughs> appropriate result. Um, so what? So the library is now a big collection of terrible web applications. Everything's awful. <laughs> what do we do about it? We have choices. We as organizations and as a profession, we have chosen to cede responsibility for certain tasks to software, to apply our limited resources elsewhere to let software take over uh, and algorithms take over some of these tasks. But we can make different choices. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those choices that we can make, and I'm gonna start with the really, really hard ones and get to the almost easy ones. Um, I'm now gonna invoke business for the second time here, which I'm a little self-conscious about, but uh, there is this uh, sort of maxim attributed to Peter Drucker, who is a, you know, a, he's always uh, referred to as a business guru, which is really weird. Um, never outsource your core competency. And this is about uh, protecting your business and your business's interests. I would argue that software has never been a core competency in libraries. But if software is as central to our work and to our services, as we all now agree that it is, right? Right? We all agree? All right. 
Shouldn't this be our core competency or one of them? The hardest thing that we can do here and maybe the most important thing that we can do is to build software. And this is not necessarily saying that every library needs to take up the mantle of building their own software in-house from scratch. It's something that we need to do collectively. Um, I will be watching very closely the Olay and Index data developments that I don't know if uh, you folks saw. They were in, sort of jointly announced at Code for Lib and Computers and Libraries last week that Index Data um, is going to be building an open source ILS based on microservices. Uh, this is very interesting. And so this sort of raises the question, if we're going to build software, um, there has been so much talk over the past couple of years, should librarians learn to code? I don't care. But libraries should learn to code. And this is the point where some of you are saying, but what about all the software that libraries do develop? What about our repositories? What about DPLA? What about HathiTrust? What about our open access publishing? And so here is where I go deep into editorializing. Um, and I will apologize in advance um, for that. Uh, I want to talk about something that is uh, one name for it is the streetlight effect. And it's uh, best explained with uh, an anecdote. Um, uh, it goes like this. One night, uh, in a city of moderate size, there's a beat cop out doing his rounds. Uh, this is how you know this is a made up story, right? <laughs> um, uh, and he passes a bar walking down the sidewalk. And as he passes the bar, he looks down the block and under a street light, the other end of the block, he can barely make out a person sort of bent over uh, underneath the, the street light in the cone of the, the street light there. And so of course he walks up to investigate um, and talks to the guy. He says, what are you doing? The guy says, oh, I was at the bar down there and I um, ready to head home and I can't find my car keys. And so the cop says, oh, all right, you know, Thankfully, the guy seems like he's in a reasonable condition to drive. Uh, the, the beat cop uh, says, okay, well, let me, let me help you find your keys, and gets down with him, and you know, is uh, looking around, looking around, looking around. He looked around for a few minutes, and the cop says, boy, I, I, I don't see your keys anywhere. Are you sure that, um, that you didn't leave them in your car or something? He says, well, my car's parked down in front of the bar. Well, if you were at the bar and your car's parked in front of the bar, why are you here looking for your keys? And the guy says, well, the light is great down here. The light is better here. Um, when it comes to the software that libraries have developed today, the light is pretty great over here where we're doing software development. This is not to take away from the important and difficult work that's going on in this space, but the rights in a lot of cases are relatively easy. We are uh, the, the domain of many of the software projects that libraries are developing is explicitly open access. We're asking for a click-through promise from people who deposit into a repository. This is open access, and then we can uh, build and deploy our software without a lot of concern for rights. The tech is, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's relatively easy compared to trying to interact with legacy library systems and you know, enterprise systems at scale. And speaking of scale, the software that libraries are developing, by and large, is at a tiny scale. The number of people who are interacting with our repositories, with um, things like this that are, that are being built from scratch in libraries, is tiny. So tiny compared to uh, the, user, the number of users who are interacting with the systems that we license. And this concerns me. A lot of these software projects are bets on the future, and they're important, and we should be making bets on the future. But we need to be very cautious about where we invest our best and brightest software minds and where we invest uh, our software efforts to ensure that we are around for that future, frankly. We are largely ignoring, in our software development efforts inside libraries, this crucial loop this research loop where we know that the vast majority of our users spend the vast majority of their time. 
and where we can, statistically speaking, make the greatest impact. I was fortunate enough to hear uh, Lisa Welchman speak at MiniWebCon a couple of years ago, and uh, she is someone who writes about digital governance. Um, and one thing that she said really stuck with me, and that was that an organization's priorities are revealed in its structure. And so I, I would ask, does your org chart reflect the importance of software to your library? I suspect that few do. And so the second hardest, or maybe tied for first, thing that I think that we need to do is to transform our organizations so that we can focus on software as the central delivery method for our services. And in order to do that, we need to build skills. Some of these, uh, I'm gonna talk about a few of the skills that I think are, are necessary to have in libraries to respond to this. Um, some of these we already have and need more of. Uh, some, many libraries don't have it all. So we need skill in creating metadata for algorithms. We heard in the keynote and the Q&A this morning about the challenges of creating metadata for systems that are driven by algorithms and the, uh, the problems in our, in our metadata that are exposed by these algorithms. One thing we can do is acknowledge the algorithms and if we can't control them, then at least we can control some of what they're fed. We can build metadata that acknowledges that it is primarily for algorithms. Likewise, we can improve our skill at indexing and our knowledge of indexing. And I'm not talking about you know, creating the paper index of a journal or something like that. I'm talking about search indexing and things like that. I think we need skills in user interface development. Um, I think we need uh, greatly improved knowledge of web services. And I don't mean, you might have a, a group or a person in your library that's a web services librarian or the web services department, I'm not talking about the person who puts content onto your website. I'm talking about the data interconnections between applications that allow us to influence what appears where. Uh, and this is something that, that I think we need desperately. Systems analysis. We should all be able to understand the inner workings of the systems we deploy. Even if we can't peer directly into the black box, we should understand roughly what's going on under the hood. And likewise, business analysis. We need to be able to, in our libraries, develop real and validated requirements for the systems that we license and develop. So those are some of the skills that I think we need. And the nice thing here is that if you squint at the skills of metadata librarians and technical <laughs> services staff and systems librarians and even public services librarians, they look not too far off from what we really desperately need. But transformation of those roles is required here. Just because information technology has the word information in it does not mean that librarians are already good at it. And none of these changes can happen, in my opinion, without acknowledging promotion and tenure incentives that we set up in our libraries. I suspect, I, I am not in the librarian track uh, at, at my job anymore, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm conjecturing here a little bit. But I suspect it, that it is the case that if you are a tenure track librarian in an academic library, you are far more likely to be able to put on your CV the hour that you spent teaching a workshop to two people than an hour that you spent uh, working with a developer to use your domain knowledge to improve the user interface in your catalog. And that's a problem, in my opinion. That's a problem of incentives uh, being misaligned. If we are not gonna build software, we need to master the software that we have. We need to invest the time and energy to understand as much of its inner workings as we have access to, to tune it, to evaluate its effectiveness, to negotiate ruthlessly with evidence with our vendors. And similarly, we need to transform our acquisitions process. We need to evaluate the software that we're licensing, not just the content. We need to take care to ensure that the software that we're licensing is usable, 
that it's accessible. And one example that I can give is that we did some usability testing of one of our ebook platforms. Uh, Charles is here and can speak to this. And, uh, and it was a, a fantastic result. It was the first time we'd ever done anything like that. There was a clear usability distinction between two competing platforms where we could purchase a lot of the same content. And by having the right people in the room, we were able to say, hey, let's stop buying stuff over here and buy it over here because it's much more usable. And here I would point to a recent Ithaca study um, that, uh, a day in the life of a serious researcher, and I'll have, a, I'll have a link to that as well, where among the many fascinating tidbits that this ethnographic study of researchers uh, turned up was the fact that, much as we might like to think different, even senior veteran researchers are incredibly susceptible to the tiniest bit of friction in their experience working with our software. If they are unable to accomplish a particular search task, they are quite likely to abandon their current approach or tool or technology rather than figure out how to make it work. If it's not usable, it might as well not exist. That is money wasted. All right, and so now the easiest thing that we can do, and I think this is really as easy as it gets, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I think we need to create a culture in our organizations where there's an understanding that our software is everyone's responsibility. This is not an IT problem. This is not an electronic resources problem. This is everyone's problem um, when there's a problem with our software. And with that, I will say thanks to you all for coming. We've got some time. I'm looking forward to some conversation. Um, here's some quick links. Uh, these are the, these go to the same places, but maybe this one's a little easier to read. This is the essay that I wrote uh, last fall. Here's Matt Reedsma's uh, article. Here's uh, the Ithaca study that I mentioned. And here are some credits. So, any questions, comments, thoughts? <laughs> I, I, I think you were first there. I uh, am feeling okay because some of those things that you mentioned are actually written into my PAT. Departments, so, <laughs> yeah, for me, right? yeah. <laughs> except that we're trying to uh, intentionally break down the barriers between tech services and public services and construction. And, uh, so, part of my responsibility is to be reference and construction and kind of being out of where our users are and seeing how they interact with our tools. Fortunately, we haven't gone the other way and said, well, reference and construction librarians, you better know your tech stuff. You have to know how that software works. Yep. Um, we've been fortunate that largely they do or have an interest in, in understanding, but it's not part of their requirement, right. but I think it should be. Yeah, I, I think there's there's nothing clearer to me at this point than that that is public service. And in a lot of cases, what we are accustomed to as public service, speaking in terms of quantity of interactions, not quality, which I recognize is a, a distinction, traditional public service is a rounding error compared to the public service that we're providing through software. Uh, Matt, you have a Are there any kind of uh, other like specific practical examples of how this insight is changing the way that you're thinking about the work that you're doing? Or... Uh, well, uh, um... I'm sorry, the question you're repeating? Yes, uh, so uh, Matt's question was, uh, are there any more specific practical examples of how this thinking is changing the way that I do my work? Um, I, uh, I hope that this is part of all the work that I do. I think of this as, as my job, and um, one way that this is maybe the best example that I can give, although we'll see if it satisfies you. Um, one way that I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, put this into practice is by seeding, so I, I work in IT in the libraries, I'm director of web development, seeding responsibility for uh, a lot of what happens within our website and applications to public service folks, people who are you know, in, in sort of business analysis parlance, the business owners, the people who should have the relationships with the, the users, and acknowledging that uh, just because IT is where some of these things were incubated, that doesn't mean that we should own them outright. They should be services that the libraries own broadly and uh, that we should put ourselves in a position to take direction 
on them from uh, other parts of the library. And that uh, can be a little uncomfortable to uh, you know, let other people take the reins a little bit, but I think it's really important. David, you have? Yeah, Cody, thanks. I think this was awesome. Thanks. I also think the audience should also be people like library directors and associate university librarians and such people. Um, you know, I mean, recently we had somebody come in from the CIC and tell us that back office services were stupid and we should have nicely dressed people standing at the front door. Um, how do we change the mindset among the people who actually make the policies? Um, for those of you who are streaming online, uh, David's comment was, that was awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that, uh, it's a little bit of a minefield you've laid out for me there, David. Um, but I, <laughs> um, I think that the best way that we can um, make this apparent to people who may be a little further removed from the day-to-day -day work of technology or public services is with data. Um, and I think we are building, uh, you know, at, at the University of Minnesota Libraries, I think I'm trying to build some of that case with data. Um, and uh, that's, that's my best guess. But uh, it's interesting. I, um, one of my colleagues talked about at a, at a former library that he worked at, uh, you know, idle chatter with other librarians. How soon will it be before uh, we have the first tenured professors at the university who have never set foot in the library? And that's certainly happened by now. We are definitely in the era of how soon will it be, if not already, that the first uh, chair of a department who's never set foot in the library um, as, you know, grad student, undergrad, whatever, uh, is uh, hired out of university? How soon will it be uh, before the first dean uh, who has never set foot in a library, because that is going to happen. Um, and we need to be able to speak to those people about the library that they know. Um, and so that may be a way to address some of this with people whose primary concerns are rightly deans and department chairs and things like that. A uh, guess. Other questions or comments? What do you think about, I, I think a lot of times libraries spend a lot of effort on user spaces and trying to, you know, lure patrons into the library, I guess you could, you could use that word. Um, what, what do you feel about that kind of focus versus the focus of actually, you know, making demands of your software, working with your vendors to say, no, we're spending this amount of money on this and it has to do this right. type of thing. Well, I don't think that's an either or. That's just about how we set the balance because uh, library as space is a real and important thing. And this is not, uh, I'm not trying to lay out a case here against physical library space because I, as I said, I think that arguably the uh, sort of academically zoned space on campus for people to interact with software, do, you know, because that, that's what research and study looks like now, is as important as it's ever been. Um, so it, it's just a matter of, you know, relative priority that we give uh, to those things. And, uh, you know, we are always going to be resource constrained, and we just have to make the best decisions that we can about how to allocate those resources. I, I, I don't have a, a quick answer, I'm afraid. Peter. So, I, I, your example about making you, you do X part of the purchasing decisions mm -hmm. rather than executing. Uh, I wonder if there are other things you think you could. You know, are we asking enough of vendors beyond just the question of the UX they're providing? Things like, are there, are there other things you think we could sort of reframe the negotiations around and make? Um, for those of you who are online, uh, Pete's comment was, that was awesome. <laughs> um, and then he followed up with, uh, what else can we do aside from doing usability and accessibility evaluations of software that we license to try to reframe our relationship with vendors? Is that a fair restatement yeah, of your question? Yeah, where else can we apply pressure? I will say, 
like zero part of my job has anything to do with negotiating or interacting with vendors, and for that I am glad every day. Um, but uh, so I don't have a lot of personal experience to draw on here. So I, I would defer to some of my colleagues who, who do more of that work. But I would say that um, it is always worthwhile uh, to use what levers that we have to uh, extract uh, information from our vendor partners and. Um, I don't want to come off as totally antagonistic to vendors. There are things that we shouldn't do. There are things that are that are better done at scale and better done commercially, and, and we can talk about what some of those might be. But as an example, I would give you uh, the uh, most recent Minitex RFP for statewide electronic resources, where uh, one of uh, my colleagues on that group had the presence of mind to include a question about how do you store passwords? Um, you know, and and because that was a public process and the response was a public document, we got information into the public record about how vendors are handling user passwords. We can do similar uh, with questions that are more directly related to usability, user experience, accessibility. I mean, it's really easy to ask. Accessibility is always tough. We can always ask, you know, are you Section 508 compliant? They're like, oh, yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, because you can, you know, you can check that box. Uh, relatively easily, but um, you know, we can ask for uh, audits on the you know, privacy aspects of software. How, how do they track users? Um, what are their uh, analytics that they run on the back end? Things like that, ask for examples. Um, but uh, RFPs the size of Minitexes don't come around all that often. We don't have very many opportunities to do that at scale. There aren't very many institutions that have the clout um, to ask those kinds of questions and get <laughs> and get honest answers, um, and so I think we need to take uh, care to use those opportunities when we have them. Uh, so that's one example. Yes. One of the things that I'm thinking about uh, with these ideas um, are we, as a field, uh, kind of I don't know how to put this. Is there enough competition because we don't want to not have certain packages and interfaces because our, our peers also have them? So are we kind of causing <coughs> some of that, this rush to, to have these electronic interfaces um, and maybe being like, ah, we don't really want to do due diligence, we just really need it to be out there. And so it, do we have our own kind of internal competition that's maybe making us disregard some of these things, and, and if that is the case, do you think that that might be at play? Is there something that we can do cooperatively to maybe slow things down a little bit and, and ease the competition? Um, yeah, so uh, the question was, can we, uh, are we uh, sort of keeping up with the Joneses with, with other libraries to, and, and rushing into some of these uh, software uh, acquisitions and, and agreements? and? Um, I think that's part of it. Um, I think much, a much greater pressure comes from our desire to serve and the fact that uh, we are not interested in, and, and we're really just like at our core it is difficult for librarians to say no. Um, and that, there's, that's really laudable, like we want to help people. And when somebody comes to us and says, hey, can you license this journal for me? It's in this incredibly craptacular, you know, web, web UI. Uh, you can't use your proxy server for it. You have to have this, you know, password that you share amongst, you know, all of your users and it's sent over HTTP and, you know, that's fine, right? Um, and if we want to um, make some changes in the kind of software that we provide to our users, we're gonna have to strongly consider saying no to some of those requests or being as creative as possible to, and, and as forthright as possible with our users, especially influential users, to say, I would like to license this. However, here's how much it's gonna cost. And we know from experience that the, the platform that this particular journal is on is a huge impediment to use for the majority of our users. And so, you know, we would be serving the three or four of you who already, uh, you know, maybe you and your buddies are already on the editorial board for this journal. You're gonna get your copy of it. You're gonna share your preprints um, with your with your colleagues in the field, um, and uh, we we can't justify 
licensing it for our library for these reasons. Um, I, again, likewise, I spend 0% of my time interacting with faculty, for which I'm grateful every day. Um, and so I will not be the person having those conversations necessarily. I don't know. I, I, there's enough people who work with me in here that I might be uh, putting my foot in it. But uh, anyway, uh, that's where I see the strongest pressure to, to uh, take on some of these things. Brian? I can only speak my own experience going through uh, graduate school. I, I will share that there wasn't a lot of pressure to get tech savvy in this sense. Are you aware of any schools that either require a certain level of you know, coding or that sort of thing, or is their message getting down to the degree granting institutions? Like, hey, you really need to get on board with sort of better preparing uh, graduates for this, this line of uh, this discipline? So I'm just pretending that the stream is still working here. Um, for those of you who are online, uh, the question was, is, is LIS education providing people with these skills? Is that appropriate encapsulation? I mean, uh, I think the availability is there. I guess I just don't know the emphasis. Right, it, yeah, is, is the emphasis uh, in LIS education appropriately on these skills? And I can honestly say I have no idea. Um, and uh, again, speaking, just for myself, I don't know if I care. Um, I don't know that it is necessary that librarians have all of these technical skills. Um, you know, I mean, you know as well as I do that the developers, the people that we have working on software at our library, are not librarians, um, and that's different. At, at you know, there, there are variations on that at a lot of institutions. Um, and uh, in my opinion, we need to be really careful about uh, making a librarian, you know, a library science degree a requirement for technical uh, positions, because I think often that uh, amounts to an excuse to pay people a lot less than they could get uh, on the open market with this kind of skills that, uh, that we need. Um, I think one thing that we may have to do here is recognize that if we need User interface developers. If we need people who are uh, skilled developers, we have to pay for them. Um, and uh, and the most efficient way to do that may not be to alter the course of library science education and uh, and turn librarians or proto librarians into developers um, because that might just be saddling people with a whole lot more debt. Um, and uh, anyway, it, I, I have real mixed feelings. Other questions or comments? We got like one minute left. Uh, all right, yes. Uh, I was gonna say, I think sometimes it's less the knowledge of coding that maybe matters in my workplace as the knowledge, having enough knowledge to be able to muscle your way onto like university-wide committees with people from marketing, the IT folks in the IT department, and to influence like what's happening with what I would say in, in those ways. And so, Knowing they're coding, maybe to understand what to really push and advocate for, but spending more time on the politics has gotten me farther to think. But yes. This is where I am. Yeah, that's absolutely true, and you don't have to go very far to find. Sorry, the the, question, the comment was about the uh, that. Uh, learning uh, technology skills may be less effective than just learning your way around the bureaucracy at your institution that manages some of these technologies. And I think that, that can be very true. Um, and uh, you don't have to go very far to find a whole lot of sturm und drang about librarians versus IT. Um, and I think that uh, we are shooting ourselves in the foot if we uh, assume that there's a, there's a conflict there and that uh, you know, we need to do everything that we can to bridge that gap. The, the reverse is true also, of course. But, uh, all right, we're at time. Thank you all so much for coming. And <laughs>